afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. And this is a very difficult message for me to be able to share with you guys uh, because we're going into how, how we are put together um, both spiritually, physically, etc. And then how also to truly get into the presence of Almighty God in order for um, us to connect with our Heavenly Father. Uh, to be able to connect spiritually to, to such a degree to where uh, you can get answers from the Heavenly Father directly yourself. And I'm sure many of you already know these things. Uh, so maybe I'm just kind of like, as a old saying goes, singing to the choir, right? But what I wanted to share with you is we're basically like a three-part being to begin with. We have, a, we have soul, uh, spirit, and our body. And, but even in a spiritual sense, there are three parts that make us up that connect us uh, to heavenly realms. And, you know, we have the soul, we have the spirit, and we have the mind uh, or our thoughts. And it's literally, and a lot of people would think, okay, well, it's the soul or it's the spirit that connects us. But oddly enough, um, and, and I guess in one way we, should, we could say all three are true, but when we're going into certain spiritual realms, it's actually your mind, your thought that connects you to that. And so I wanted to share some scriptural uh, things with you that might be of help uh, in, in unraveling a lot of this type of a mystery. And so this first, I want to take you first here to Matthew chapter 22. And this here, uh, we'll, we'll start verse 35 or 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is likened unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, I'm not looking, when I look at this scripture here, I'm not here to focus on whether we're looking at the law or, 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 or the law of life, which is through Jesus Christ. But in this case here is specifically those words there. The, Sir, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, right? With all your soul and with all your mind. Now, if we look at the word mind or the word thought, we can go, for example, there's two scriptures that use the word thought here, which is basically the same thing as your mind that I found there's only three scriptural references in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, also in Acts chapter 10, verse 19. And then there's another, and I believe it's over here in Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 4. The word thought has many different translations in Greek or, or in, as well as in the Hebrew language. But consistently, this word here shows you three examples, two of which the thoughts brought these people into the presence of, a, of the angel of the Lord. The, and of course, the third one, uh, it takes their, their thoughts, take them into an evil direction. So basically, the, my, my purpose in sharing this with you is what we meditate our minds upon, the more we begin to think upon our Heavenly Father and we think of good thoughts, it will take you into the presence of Almighty God. And we have need of this at this hour we're living in, really placing our mind and our thoughts on Him. Here's the examples. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto, Mary the, uh, take, take unto you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. 
Now, remember, this was where Joseph, he was minded not to make her a public example because she was pregnant. He knew he had not been with her, and he was having a hard time dealing whether or not this was truly a child from the Lord. All right? So he was minded to put her away privately as a result of that. So, so it says, but while he thought on these things, see, he was thinking, his mind was just consumed with trying to deal with, you know, what am I to do with this? And it brought him into the presence of the Lord. And he received this dream here of what to do. All right. In the book of Acts, we read here. Uh, let's back up. Verse 17, Acts chapter 10. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry of Simon's house, stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek you. Arise, therefore, get you down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And again, his thoughts just continually upon those things of spiritual matters, which literally, not only did he already had a vision to start with, but now in the vision, he's thinking on it, and the Lord reveals to him about the three men coming. Now, if we take that in the negative sense as well, we can look at the fact that uh, Jesus says here, in uh, Matthew chapter 9, Behold, they brought to him, verse 2, a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven you. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Where, uh, Wherefore think you evil in your heart? For whether it's easy to say, thy sins be forgiven you, or to say, arise and walk. But that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then said he to the sick of the palsy, rise, take up your bed, and go into your own house. Okay? Now their thoughts were just on the evil. Now... You know, there is an ancient document in the Egyptian writings, and it was interesting because the question was asked of Jesus, you know, how do we see visions? Is it with our soul or with our spirit? And the answer came back. Jesus actually answered this question. It's not a biblical. We don't have it as part of our own canon. It's just... Uh, so we, we can only look at it from a historic uh, perspective. But in light of what the scripture does say, I can see where it could be true. He answered and he said, neither one. He said, but yet the mind or the, or the thought, and keep in mind, that, that's, that's very difficult to answer as well because there are so many different words for the word mind or the word thought, both in Greek and in Hebrew. But his answer was, with the mind is where visions are saw. It's a place in between the two. And he actually answers it like that. Then we look right here, and I find that interesting in light of Hebrews chapter 4. And I'm going to back up to verse 10. For he that is entered into his rest, he also ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and marrow and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You see, so the word of God, like a sword, it divides between the soul and the spirit. It just goes right down in between in the middle opens them up, soul and spirit are moved to either side, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. So there again, with your mind, that place in the middle, this separated between soul and spirit, we find the intent. 
we find in the case of what I showed you in the scripture, one is thinking upon good things and goes into the presence of God. The other thinks on an evil thing, but it's still the meditation of their heart or the meditation of their mind. And sometimes those kind of cross the barrier as far as the verbiage that is used scripturally. But I still find a, a very a very real, um, I find a very uh, a realistic uh, differences even in the Hebrew verbiage or the Greek verbiage when we're dealing with this here. All right. So we move, we continue on, and uh, let's see, what do I have this opened here for? I don't recall. Um, why do you think, Evie, yeah, why do you say it was the same scripture there as the one we just read here? Now, in Proverbs, we read, Eat you not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire you his dainties. For as one hath reckoned within himself, so is he. And eat and drink, saith he to you, but his heart is not with you. Now that's actually, if we go to, let me just take you to Proverbs 23, 7 in King James, so it makes more sense to you what we're reading here. Because um, most of you are used to this from that verse as a Hebrew translation of it. Okay, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, says he to you, but his heart is not with you. All right, now, again we read it, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And the Hebrew version of that is, kikomo sha'ar benefesho. All right, as he, the, the literally, it goes on, for as one that you can say, Sha'ar is another Hebrew for, word for the word thought, but thinks in his soul. As he thinks in his soul, Ken who? So is he. Ochea veshute, eat and drink. Yo marlecha, they say to you. Ve'levo, and his heart. Bal uh, imcha is not with you. Again, it's the verbiage that is used here. See, we get in the King James, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And it literally, as, it, as he thinks in his soul, so is he. And then it goes on to say, but his heart is not with you. Uh, and then if we go into uh, Matthew 22, Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God, again, going back to this one here, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So again, we have three different components. And the thing that we want to do is we're wanting to really recognize that our that our thoughts are what's going to bring us into the presence of God. If we look at Romans chapter 8, for example, but, uh, and let me back up to verse, yeah, we need to back up a little bit here. Verse 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, you shall die. I don't know if 
how many really get what he says here when he says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. He's talking about the law. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. All right. I know that's hard to hear, but it's true. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. He's talking about the law because one law is carnal and one law brings you into bondage and into death and you don't get anywhere at all. You just stay trapped in a realm, in a cycle that you can't get out of. But when you, through the Spirit, you mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And of children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so uh, be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. All right. So going again. So I, what I'm trying to do when I'm when I'm sharing this information with you, this message with you, is to get our minds and our thoughts on him. Because as long as we are trapped in the carnal side, the carnal mindedness. Uh, when I say carnal mindedness, you can sit there all day long and go back and, and read the Old Testament, look at the laws that God gave to Israel uh, and, and say, oh, I want to keep I want to keep the traditions. I want to keep Sukkot. I want to keep uh, Passover. I want to keep all these different carnal laws that were put out there. You're still carnally minded. And then you get trapped into an earthly kingdom that you can't break free from. And all these were, they served a purpose. They were types and shadows of the coming of Jesus Christ. That's all they were, were set for. If you look at Sukkot, Sukkot is a foreshadowing of the coming of Christ. And... But when you revert back to them, you become trapped. That's why Paul writes here, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. A debtor to the flesh is one that keeps having to offer sacrifice for his sins. You see, if you continue to keep the law, you continue to have to offer those sacrifices for your sins. You're not free men. You are bound and in bondage under the law. And that law keeps you trapped in this dimension and you'll never get out of it. But he goes on to say, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of your body, you shall live. And the only emphasis that I make on the thoughts, the place between the soul and the spirit, is to get it to where you can take of your own initiative, really begin to meditate upon the Lord, putting your thoughts completely on him and asking him to know the truth of the matter so that he can reveal himself to you. So that if our minds truly become full of Jesus Christ and his thoughts, his mind, his way, then you can break free. Because I guarantee you one thing, as I watch what's happening in this world today, even down to your New World Order, your Israel, everyone, there's so many people that are so trapped and Israel is, has to become a nation again. Israel, in order for them to recognize Christ, and it's gone beyond the fact of them recognizing Christ now. Now it's the fact that Israel just has to become a nation. Israel has to, uh, to build a third temple, and now everybody is saying, oh, it's fulfilling scripture. The law is going to come out of Israel. And every Messianic, every Hebrew Roots group that is out there is all building the law right back up again, preparing themselves. And of course, you being a Gentile, if you're a Gentile, you're going to be under the Noahide laws because even though they're not biblical, they still sound biblical. Uh, and uh, although there's only seven and there's not ten commandments, but nonetheless, when you get the seven, they've got about a hundred sub laws to go with it. And most of those are going to cause you to have your head cut off eventually. 
Hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. So my desire is for you to truly recognize you do not have to be under such bondage. And so many people, they're saying, oh my gosh, you know. By the way, this is why everybody wants to beat up on Paul and say he's a false apostle. Let alone the fact that Jesus already told you that. Jesus already told you that there were, you know, as he was tempted, remember, by the lawyer himself, right? What does he say here? Um, I forget where it was at now. Maybe it was over here. Yeah, here we go right here. Pharisees had heard that he had put the, let's see. Uh, yeah, Jesus is dealing with the resurrection of the dead, which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But when, but when the Pharisees had heard that, heard that, he had put the Sadducees to silence. They were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Okay, in other words, they, because see why, the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection. And that's where Jesus, you know, the res, let's see, if we back up a little further. Um, this is where they're dealing with the law, where they had seven brothers, and the first one, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother, and likewise the second, also the third, and even in the seventh, all, all of them died, right? So they're sitting there with the law. Who's going to end up getting her, you know, after, after? It said, therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall be of the seven, for they all had her? Jesus said, answered seven, you do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. You know, the funny thing is, the, Pharisees, the Sadducees didn't even believe in the resurrection, they're just wanting to know who's going to get the girl because they're basing it on the law. And then Jesus puts them to silent. He said, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are the, as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. That kind of blows out even the Pharisaic doctrine, right? In other words, when, as we would say, they died, it's not like they got to be resurrected. He's letting you know that when they died, they're not sitting in a grave somewhere in some hole somewhere and can't get out, but they're already alive. They're the God. He's the God of the living, not the dead. So really, in a way, he blows away the Pharisee doctrine and the Sadducee doctrine. And then, of course, they go into the commandment now. Now, they're, now they figure, okay, we got him. He's on our side, but let's, let's see what he says about this issue here. Which one is the great commandment? Well, of course, Pharisees are all about law. That's why they have to have lawyers, because they're all about the law. And then he says, only, basically, there's only two. The first commandment, the great commandment. The second is likened to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Didn't need anything else. Didn't need anything else. And while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think you of Christ? Whose son is he? They said unto him, The son of David. He said unto him, How then doth David in the Spirit call him Lord? By the way, that just kind of adds to the whole argument right here, right? He's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. It shows then, in other words, what is he saying even in this regards here? He's showing you that if God is the God of the living of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then surely the son of David was living also before he ever got to the earth. Hmm. Well, we can go all kinds of different directions here, can't we? Amazing. Ah, so he said, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. That's We already went through that one as well, so I think we've got that done. For he that thinketh that we've already done that one too. So I hope somehow or another this will bless your heart as you listen to this. Uh, and we want to thank you for listening. Thank you too for your support of the work that we do here. Our website right there above my head, IsraeliNewsLive.org. And um, by the way, the interview that is on our website right now 
this cannot be on the platform we're speaking to you now on because of uh, the censorship would have it, the channel shut completely down. We already know this because this man was interviewed by me, or not by me, but by another person, and their channel was shut completely down. Uh, I really think you should take time to look to look at it. I'm not even going to mention the name that is in there. Just uh, you can see what the interview is about, who it's about. Uh, take the time to watch it. I certainly encourage you to do so. And we thank you for your, uh, your love and kindness in supporting this ministry. You can do that online, by the way, if you happen to be on our website or by mail to Noon Institute, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. Thank you and God bless you.